What is a vector database? A vector database is used to store data into a vectorial representation. Let's say you have some data. Text data, image data, user data, time series data. We have many techniques in machine learning to encode data into a vector representation. Once you have this vector representation, you can store the data into a vector database and index the data through the vector representation. Why do we need vector databases? Let's say you have a product and you want to find similar items. You could encode that product using machine learning and you can search into a vector database where similar items are stored. You can search similar items using similarity metrics computed on the vector representation. Why do we need vector databases in the context of LLM? It's very typical to work with private data and LLMs. The way to go about it, usually, is to break down the data into chunks and to encode each chunk using a LLM into a vector representation. And you can store that vector representation into a database. You can then question that vector database using similarity metrics. Let's say that a user asks a question. That question is then encoded into a vector representation. That vector representation can be used as a query to a vector database. The vector database is then going to return the nearest neighbors and the data related to those nearest neighbors can be used into a prompt that can be fed into a LLM to get the answer to the question. Vector databases are fundamental tools in information retrieval with machine learning. In the context of LLMs, they allow to augment LLMs with additional data. With vector databases, we retrieve quickly information to give more context to an LLM for it to provide more educated answers. What does similar mean for two vectors? Let's say you have two vectors A and B. They have two dimensions, and they can be represented in a two-dimensional plane. For example, we could use the Euclidean distance to measure how far apart they are in the space. We need to be aware of the limitations of metrics when computing similarity metrics. For example, here we have two points A and B on the same axis, and we measure a specific Euclidean distance between those two points. Here we have two points C and D on two different axes, and we measure the same Euclidean distance between those two points. Do we actually have the same similarity between those two points? We could also measure the dot product between those two vectors. It takes into account the angle between those two vectors and the magnitude of those two vectors. Let's consider those two sets of points A and B and C and D. You can see that we measure the same Euclidean distance between those two sets of points, but the angle with respect to the origin is very different. On the left, with A and B, we have an angle that is less than 90 degrees, where on the right, with C and D, we have an angle that is equal to 180. The result of that is that the cosine of an angle that is smaller than 90 degrees is going to be positive. We have the cosine of an angle that is greater than 90 degrees is going to be negative. So the dot product on the left is positive and the dot product on the right is negative. What that means in terms of similarity is that the dot product looks at A and B as being very similar, where C and D are very dissimilar. Another metric is a cosine similarity metric. It is very similar to the dot product. The dot product considers the magnitude and the angle between the two vectors. The cosine similarity only considers the angle between the two vectors. Let's look, for example, at those two sets of points. We have A and B very close to each other in Euclidean distance, and we have C and D very far apart in Euclidean distance. But when we measure the angle between the two vectors, we actually get the same angle. So when it comes to cosine similarity metric, those two sets of vectors have the same similarity. When you index your database, it is important to think about what is the right metric for your use case. It is good to know about the differences in the way the different metrics will define the concept of similarity. When you retrieve information, you want to make sure it is relevant for your application. With vector databases, it's very important to index the data such that you can retrieve the data very quickly. Let's say you have a vector and you would like to find nearest neighbors in a database. If the data was not indexed, you will need to go through each vector and compute a similarity metric to understand which vectors were the closest to the query vector. The time complexity would be linear in the number of vectors, which means that if you had trillions of vectors, you would need to iterate through each of those vectors to compute a similarity index. That would be way too long. Indexing the data allows you to retrieve the right information quickly, even if you have trillions of vectors. There are many techniques to index the data, and they are typically known as approximate nearest neighbors algorithms.
Product quantization is a typical indexing method for vector databases. The idea is to partition vectors into small pieces and to look at those different pieces separately. Let's imagine we have a set of vectors. We can partition them into subvectors and we can study each partition independently. On each partition, we run a k-means algorithm to cluster the different subvectors. Once we have learned the clusters, we can store the cluster centroids. The cluster centroids act as approximation of the different vectors. When we have a new query vector, we can then partition it, and then we can see to which cluster those subvectors belong to. When we want to retrieve nearest neighbors, we just need to return the subvectors that belong to those clusters. When looking for nearest neighbors, it is often not important to be perfectly accurate. Product quantization is a way to quantize the vector space to represent vectors with less precision. The idea is to cluster vectors and index the cluster centroids instead of the vectors themselves. When looking for the nearest neighbors to a query vector, we just need to pull the vectors from the closest cluster. It is a faster search and indexing the vectors takes much less memory space. Instead of having to iterate through each vector, we just need to iterate through the cluster centroids. There's a balance between search latency and accuracy. The more clusters we use, the better would be the hash and more accurate would be the return nearest neighbors. But it will increase the search latency as we will need to iterate through more clusters. This is still a brute force approach as the algorithm scales with the number of clusters, but it can be used in combination with other algorithms. Another indexing method is locally sensitive hashing. The idea is to bucket the space into small partitions. When we have a query vector, we just retrieve the vectors within that partition. A technique to have a high control on the way to partition the space is to first project the different vectors into a different space. We use a random matrix with defined dimension such we know exactly what dimension will be the projected space. The idea is that we can use the hyperplanes passing by the origin to separate the points that are above and below. For example, the plane passing by the zero of the z-axis can separate the vectors below and above. We have similarly the hyperplane passing by the x-axis. And here we have the hyperplane passing by the y-axis. We can then hash every vector depending on where they belong in that projected space. When we have a query vector, we just retrieve the vectors that belong to the same quadrant of space. Locally sensitive hashing aims to group vectors together based on similarity. Every vector assigned the same hash will be closed in the vector space and can be labeled nearest neighbors. The time complexity to hash a vector is proportional to the dimension of the projection matrix. Retrieving the vectors with the same hash can be done in constant time. Another indexing method is navigable small world. The idea is that we have a set of vectors that we input into the database one after the other. First, I input the first vector, and then the second. I connect it to the first. And each vector I input into the database, I connect it to the k nearest neighbor. And here I'm going to choose k equal 2, so I connect c to the two nearest neighbors. Here d pops out and we connect it to the two closest neighbors. We input e and we connect it to the two nearest neighbors. We input f and we connect it to the two nearest neighbors. We input g and we connect it to the two nearest neighbors. We input h and we connect it to the two nearest neighbors. The idea is that at first the density of vectors is going to be very low and the connections tend to be in average very long. The more I input vectors, the more the density of vectors is going to be high and the connections start to be shorter and shorter. This allows us to traverse the space very quickly with the long connections and to use the short connections to refine the traversal. Let's say that we have a query vector and we want to find the nearest neighbor. We start the search at a specific point and we look at the neighbors of A. We measure the distance from the query and we move to the closest neighbors to the query. We look for the neighbors of D and we move to the position that is closest to the query. We cannot move anymore, so we found the nearest neighbor. Navigable small world networks is a process to build efficient graphs for search. We build the graph by adding vectors one after the others and connecting each node to the most similar neighbors. When building the graph, we need to decide on a similarity metric such that the search is optimized for the specific metric used to query items. The search is approximate and the node we find may not be the closest, as the algorithm may be stuck in a local minima. The problem with navigable small world is that it is a bit slow. This is what hierarchical navigable small world is trying to solve. The idea is that we have different levels of graph. 
The first level of graph here, for example, we feel the graph exactly the same way than navigable small world, but each vector is inputted with a probability smaller than one. This has a tendency to create long connections. Then we create another layer where we input the same vectors, but this time with a higher probability. So this creates intermediate lens connections. You can have as many layers as you want, but the last layer is the same layer than navigable small world with a probability one to input each of the vectors and the connections tend to be short. When we have a curly vector, it belongs to each of the layers. We first start as a layer with the lowest probability. The search happens exactly the same way than navigable small world. But when we reach the closest neighbor, we go to the next layer, and we continue the search until we find the closest neighbor, and then we continue to the next layer, and we reach the nearest neighbor as the last layer. At first, we traverse the space going through long connections, and then going through layer to layer, we tend to go through connections that are shorter and shorter. We can then traverse longer distances at the beginning and at the end refine the traversal when looking at the nearest neighbor. The problem with navigable small world is we spend a lot of iterations traversing the graph to arrive at the right node. The idea for hierarchical navigable small world is to build multiple graph layers where each layer is less dense compared to the next. Each layer represents the same vector space but not all vectors are added to the graph. The first layer allows us to traverse longer distances at each iteration, when the last layer, each iteration will tend to capture shorter distances. This allows us to find the approximate nearest neighbor in less iterations in average. Vector databases go beyond indexing and approximate nearest neighbor search algorithms. Vector databases are especially designed to manage vector embeddings and offer several advantages. For example, database operations, as any database, we have the typical database operations such as insert, delete, and update operations. We have metadata and filtering. Vector databases allow storage of metadata associated with each vector. This feature facilitates more precise queries with users able to filter results based on additional metadata. An important characteristic of a database is the scalability. Vector databases are built to scale accordingly to increasing data volumes and provide support for distributed and parallel processing.